welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens, and we are in, uh, we are in the middle of the series all about Hamlet, scene by scene. Today we are in Act Three, Scene One, the scene with the famous "to be or not to be" speech. But obviously, there is a lot more that goes on. I am just bursting with information that can't possibly be said in a short YouTube video. So, if you find yourself with any questions or additional comments at the end of this video, be sure to comment below. As always, please. Come into these videos having read or seen these scene already, otherwise this commentary will not be as helpful and that is what it's intended to be. Some additional commentary so that you learn extra stuff and you come into class more prepared or just life if you are a massive Hamlet fan like I am. So let's dive into Act 3, Scene 1 of Hamlet. So the scene starts out and it's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern with the King and the Queen. King is wanting to know how Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's mission is going. So if you remember from Act 2, Scene 2, the King has told Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to try to figure out why Hamlet is acting insane and to lead him on to pleasures. So those are their two tasks that they're supposed to fulfill. The King asks how that's going and Rosencrantz replies that he, he that is Hamlet, does confess he feels himself distracted, but from what cause he will by no means speak. This seems odd to me because literally earlier in Act 2, Scene 2, when Rosencrantz and Guildenstern said, yeah, we were sent for, Hamlet says, I'll tell you why and I'll just let you know why I'm upset. And he goes into that beautiful speech about how he looks at the earth and it seems to him a sterile promontory. Look, this majestical roof seems like a, a just a congregation of vapors and man delights not him. And he just talks about how, how depressed he is and that's the reason that he's depressed. Uh, well, that, that was really circular. He's depressed and so he's depressed. Good argumentation, everybody. Uh, but he says that's why he's acting crazy. There we go. Apparently, either Rosencrantz and Guildenstern don't buy this or they just don't understand what Hamlet is trying to get across. So they say, yeah, we, we don't really know about that. But they say we did run into some players, an acting troupe, uh, on the way here, and we invited them to come and put on a play. Now, I love this small moment when Claudius says, ooh, okay, uh, I'm excited, I'm going to go see the play as well, and it doth much content me to hear him so inclined. With all my heart I'll go to this play. Now this, my friends, is what is called dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is when the audience knows something that the characters do not. So in this case, Claudius wants to go see it, the murder of Gonzago. But what did we learn in Act 2, Scene 2? Yeah, so that's not going to work out very well for Claudius, at least not if Hamlet has anything to say about it. After Rosencrantz and Guildenstern leave, the king and the queen are uh, left with Polonius and Ophelia. Now, if you remember from uh, Act 2, Scene 2, an earlier part of that scene, Polonius has claimed that Hamlet is clearly mad for love for Ophelia. That's the only possible explanation. The king, being skeptical, demanded some extra proof, and so Polonius said, okay, fine, we'll loose the Ophelia on Hamlet, and we'll see how he reacts, and that will determine whether or not he is mad for love. So they're going to put that plan into action here in Act 3, Scene 1, and in order not to make it look quite as obvious that they're doing this, they're going to have Ophelia pretend to read a book. So it doesn't look like she's just hanging out alone, waiting for Hamlet to come by. Uh, hello, I'm Bate. Who are you? So Polonius says something interesting as he's giving her this book to read. He says, okay, read read on this book. The show of such an exercise may color your loneliness. So, uh, like I said. And then he says, we are oft to blame in this. Tis too much proved that with devotion's visage and pious action, we do sugar or the devil himself. So we sugarcoat all of our evil actions with this, you know, pious face. Basically, that's what he's saying. The reason that this is so interesting is just really well phrased, but the real reason that it's interesting is that Claudius has an aside at this moment where he says, oh, tis too true, and he talks about how his conscience is suffering for all that he's done, the murdering his brother and uh, stealing his throne. It's the first glimpse we really get into the mind of Claudius. We get 
more into his mind in Act 3, Scene 3, but this is the first place where we actually see into his mind, and it's, it's a cool glimpse. That brings us to the third soliloquy. They hear Hamlet coming, and so Claudius and Polonius hide behind a tapestry, where Polonius no doubt has some sort of hobo fire going because he lives behind there, constantly spying on everyone. And Ophelia is off to the side pretending to read this book. Now, we still call this a soliloquy, even though the technical definition of a soliloquy is that one has to be alone on stage, because Hamlet thinks that he's alone on stage. Two guys are hiding behind a tapestry, and Ophelia is way off to the side pretending to read a book. And so Hamlet, thinking he's alone on stage, gives this speech to be or not to be, that is the question. Now, I don't know why it took me so long to kind of realize this, but I had never thought about Ophelia listening in on this speech until a couple years ago when I saw a local production of the play. And to think about it, it's really quite sad because Ophelia loved Hamlet, and I'm going to show you why I think that that was true love on her end at least in just a couple minutes, but she loved Hamlet, and to hear him go through this heart-wrenching decision whether or not to kill himself is uh, just extremely sad. It adds a dimension that I hadn't considered before uh, when I was just thinking about Hamlet alone giving this speech. To be or not to be, that is the question. The, one of the most famous lines in literature, and basically the thesis statement of this entire speech. His question really is, to be or not to be, which one is better? And he gives all of these pretty convincing reasons why life is rough and why people should consider is it better not to be than to live in this terrible existence. But before I go into some of the dark nitty gritty of this speech, I want to talk about some references because we are constantly surrounded by Hamlet references all the time. I see them everywhere. So just to mention a few, oh I brought, oh here it is. So my friend got me this at the Stratford Festival. It's an eraser. Yeah, that's pretty fantastic. Thank you. You know who you are. There is also just, there's all kinds of stuff. There's a fantastic Adventures and Odyssey episode for people who like a radio drama called Mortal Coil. It was one of my favorites growing up. It was very dark and kind of twisty. Oh, there's this pin that I'm wearing. If you can't, if you can't see it, it says to sleep perchance to dream. One of my students got it for me at uh, the Globe Theater, which was really, really nice of her. My goodness. And one of the teachers that I work with last year, this year, can't remember. I think it was this year, printed out for me this. Now you may not know what that is. That's perfectly fine. It is the Star Trek Enterprise, the first adventure, Shakespearean interpretation of this particular speech. And it starts out much like Spark Notes. Shall I kill myself or not? That's what I keep asking. Very, very Spark Notey. But I was laughing so hard by the end, I have to share some of it. If you're familiar with this speech, hopefully you'll think it's hilarious too. Who would fartle a bear and put up with all that grunting and sweating if he wasn't scared of going straight to hell? Okay, that's hilarious. I don't know if you have the same kind of sense of humor as I do, but if you've stuck with me this far in the series, I'm going to hazard a guess that you at least a little bit have that nerdy sense of humor that could appreciate, I don't know, fartling a bear, which is not how you use the word. Fartle means burden. I just ruined it, didn't I? Seriously though, let's talk about this speech and keep your eyes open just for the rest of your life for Hamlet references because they're everywhere. He continually compares death to sleep, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, like my little pin says. It seems to me, he says it twice, it seems to me the first time he says to die, to sleep, he's setting up the analogy. To die is just like sleeping, but not waking up. And for anybody who feels like sleeping in, that doesn't sound so bad. And then he repeats it again, he says to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, either is the rub. To me, it's sounded for a long time like he's almost trying to convince himself that suicide is the best way to go. To die, to sleep, to sleep. He starts sinking into that way of thinking, but then he realizes, oh my goodness, I have no idea what's on the other side of death. What am I, what am I doing? 
with this. The only version of this speech that I've seen that actually plays the line that way, though, is Laurence Olivier's. Normally, I don't like his rendition at all. It's way too uptight and, ah, uh, yes, poor Yorick, and, you know, not, not that passionate, at least from the clips that I've seen, but he does that part really well, I thought. So, pretends to dream he doesn't know what's on the other side of death because, as he says, death is the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns to tell us what things are about. Now, I don't know, again, why it took me so long to realize this, but a couple years ago I realized, wait a second, from whose born no traveler returns? Literally, you just saw your ghost dad a few scenes ago. He came back, he told you what was on the other side. Granted, he's probably in purgatory, it doesn't look very good there, but what do you even mean nobody's come back? That's ridiculous. Now, this speech, for all of its famousness and beauty and on the human condition and everything, is one of the reasons why some critics have said that this is actually a poorly written play. It stops the action and it, in a place where it doesn't seem like that's necessary. Hamlet has a plan. He's going to put on a play. He's going to test his, his uh, uncle's guilt. And he just stops to reconsider the suicide that he was considering right at the beginning. So where is, where is his character headed? Why is everything so internal when this is a play meant to be seen on stage? Where's the action? So I don't know what to say about that except to present that information to you. Uh, if you want to have an argument for why Hamlet is not the best Shakespeare play, that's really the only fodder I'm going to give you. <laughs> but uh, what I think is so amazing is that, yeah, that would be a flaw in just about anybody else's play. And perhaps it is in this one, I'm not sure. But Shakespeare is such a genius that he overcomes these really blatant errors. Or they would be errors in someone else's work. The last thing I'm going to say about the third soliloquy for now is that you should definitely check out a version of it. The latest one that I've discovered that's really, really well done is Andrew Scott. It's very vulnerable, it's, it's twitchy, it feels raw, and is awesome, so go and watch that. Now let's talk about Ophelia. Ophelia comes out of the shadows after Hamlet realizes that she's there at the end of the soliloquy and says, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered, so remember me in your prayers. And Ophelia promptly says, yeah, we're breaking up. And Hamlet is not in the state of mind to accept any sort of rejection, and yet Ophelia sticks with the script. She knows that her dad and the king are watching, and so she says, no, no, you've been unkind, take back these things that you gave to me, here's your Hamlet box, essentially. And, and Hamlet just unloads on Ophelia. He is shocked and appalled that she would act this way. He starts to repeat, get thee to a nunnery. Now, nunnery can mean a nunnery, where, you know, you go to be a nun. Or in Shakespeare's day, it can also mean a brothel as well. So read that how you want to, I uh, suppose. Now, get thee to a nunnery. The first time that he says that line, it precedes one of the, well, the best parts of a speech in this scene. There are so many parts that I like, obviously. I'm gonna love this too, but he says, why would you be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest, and yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not warned me. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my back than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape, or time to act them in. We are errant knaves all, believe none of us. So he sums up just the, the sinful nature of humanity and says, yeah, I'm a decent guy. I'm indifferent, honest. I don't know that that's true, but we'll address that later. Um, I'm a decent guy, and yet inside me I feel this, this evil. It's almost like, it's almost like, um, I don't know, venom from the Marvel comics or something. There is just this evil that resides inside me. Why would you continue this race of evil beings, especially when women in particular, he'll go on to say, are so awful. More on that in a second. At the end of that speech, he realizes, wait, we're being watched. <laughs> Where's your father, he asks. Now, the version that I suggest you watch this part of the scene with is Kenneth Branagh and Kate Winslet. They do an outstanding job. I've never seen anybody come close to how great their version of this scene was. 
So get that from the library, get it on YouTube, buy it if you're me, and watch that scene. There is, if you're, if you're sensitive to domestic violence, I just want to give you a, a red flag here because that is definitely the vibe of this scene, but wow, do they knock it out of the park. Where's your father, he asks. And she tries to keep up the charade, oh, he's at home. But, of course, at this point, he knows that Polonius is not at home, that he's listening in. And Hamlet's tone gets even angrier and more vindictive toward women. You'd think it'd be toward Polonius in particular, but it isn't. It's women. He, he accuses women of all kinds of things just as a, as a group of people. He says, you paint your faces, you amble, you lisp, you nickname God's creatures. So essentially he's saying, you put on makeup, you name household animals, you're cute, dang it, and you lead us into all kinds of evil. Now, when I hear him give this speech, it seems pretty clear to me that he's not thinking about Ophelia, or at least not exclusively. I think he's considering his mother and how betrayed he feels by her. So, he ends his rant with, we shall have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. The all but one is a very, is very clearly a veiled threat against Claudius and possibly Gertrude. He knows who's listening and he wants to send a message there. And then Hamlet leaves enraged. Ophelia is left alone, brokenhearted. I feel so bad for Ophelia. What did she, what did she even do to deserve this? She did nothing. And she gives this heartbroken speech about how she used to love Hamlet and she goes through all these things that she did love about him. That he had a courtier's eye, a scholar's tongue, a soldier's sword, and you know, he was he was eloquent and he was good looking and he and everyone in Denmark looked up to him as the next leader and he was intelligent and there were all these things going for him and all of it is now like bells jangled out of tune and harsh how I, how have i come to to this state she says and i for one feel very terrible for her. enter the king and polonius the king <laughs> rightly says love that's stupid clearly that's not what's going on here that's, that can't be the reason for his madness. Polonius is about to butt in and say, actually, I still think I might be right. But we'll ignore him as he ought to be ignored and focus on what the king says. So Claudius says that, that love is probably not why he's gone insane and he seems kind of dangerous. Now at this point, remember, Claudius does not know that Hamlet knows about the murder because there were no witnesses. How could he know about the murder? Unless, I don't know, a ghost from the grave came back to describe how everything happened. So he still get, he still feels really uneasy about the whole Hamlet business. So he says, uh, well, here's the plan. He shall with speed to England for the demand of our neglected tribute. It was only about a year ago that I realized that Hamlet is actually based loosely on a historical figure that lived in about 1000 AD or CE, if that's your jam. And in 1000 AD, England was still Anglo-Saxon in nature. It had not been conquered by William the Conqueror. There was none of that. And so I realized, my goodness, the Danes going to England for neglected tribute? They're Vikings. Hamlet is a Viking. He doesn't act like a Viking. He acts like some sort of drama school kid who's all morose like the pictures. But he, they're actually Vikings, so they're going to go to England and demand their tribute from the from the weakling uh, groups over there. They're, they weren't weaklings. I'm sorry, Anglo-Saxons. That's not what I mean. But isn't that cool? I, I, my mind was blown when I realized that that was the case. So cool. Polonius responds and says, okay, we'll send him to England if you think that that's best. But let's try one more thing. Let's have him talk to his mom for uh, just privately and maybe he'll describe what's troubling him to her because they are very, I'd almost say freakishly close and perhaps he will 
admit things to his mother that he wasn't able to admit to anybody else, like the cause of his madness. And I, Polonia says, will be placed in the ear of all their conference. I will be hiding behind a tapestry, as I always am, listening in, just so that we don't get the mom slant. I'll tell you what, what they say. And then if that doesn't work, then send him to England or do whatever. So that is the scene, Act 3, Scene 1. Lots of exciting stuff happens. Again, I totally recommend that you go and watch those scenes. You know what? I'm, I'm going to find them and I'm going to link them below just for you. Hopefully they're both there on YouTube. If they are, go and watch them. They are great. So that is Act 3, Scene 1. Everybody, if you have some comments or if you liked this video, make sure to let me know below and subscribe for more English nerd goodness. I'll see you all on Monday.